Soto, Igarababa Siketarabakio Soto, Robo Siana Robo Kosiana Rabaha. We love you tonight, Jesus. We love you tonight, Jesus. We love you tonight, Jesus. Worship with them as they sing.
It's not my home. I am just passing through. Earthly treasures soon will fail, but I found my hope in you. You are the one I want. You are the one I need. This world can have it all. They can take everything.
One quick announcement: uh, We do have a uh, couple of newlyweds in the house, Mr. and Mrs. Donnell. You gotta stand to your feet real quick. Just give a quick wave to the church. <laughs> I've had the privilege of uh, baptizing uh, Brother Jr. and I've just watched him grow since he's been in the church. Uh, couldn't be more proud and found a wife. <laughs> that's the that's the biggest goal right there. <laughs> praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Um, well, tonight we have one of our uh, local ministers actually preaching the word of God. Tonight we have uh, Brother Paul Moran coming to the pulpit. Every time he comes to the pulpit, he has a word from God. Uh, he has instruction, and we're excited to hear what he has to say, say tonight. So, Brother Moran, come and take your liberty. Praise the Lord, everyone. Is God good today? Yes. Y'all sound very convinced. Is God good today? Yes. You'll, you'll find in life that when uh, you're asked to do something, it comes in bunches. Uh, I got the privilege of uh, teaching at Ben's small group. I get the privilege of preaching tonight, and then on Wednesday I get to do the kids. So I got nice three things I got going on in my head, and I'm going to try not to get them mixed up, Okay. But now I feel pastor's got it worse than me, so I, I really don't have an excuse. He has to do that every week. I'm going to talk today, very briefly, let me find out, is Ben still in here somewhere? Uh, well, I'll get him when he comes back in here. All right. Who here knows where they're going? Who knows where they're going? You know where you're going? You know where you're going? You know where you've been? You know where you've been? All right. So in the Bible, there are two situations in the New Testament that, when, that concerns Jesus that, result, that are around a fig tree. And it always amazed me the symbolism of the Bible. There's constantly layers under, on layers on layers on layers of every message that you see. Any scripture can mean so many different things if you take into account all that it, there is. And you have courses in Bible school on this that can last you semester after semester after semester. And you have preachers that are deep. I'm not that guy. <laughs> but I want to talk this today of the story of two fig trees. In Matthew 21, if you want to stand with me for the reading of the word, verse 18 now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? It was amazing, right? They watched a perfectly healthy tree. It's been spoken to by this, this man they've been following, and they watched it just dry up and die. 
Let's pray over the reading of the word. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bless each one here, Lord God, that we have ears to hear, mind to understand, and hearts willing to obey your word, Lord God, that we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, that we take whatever you have for us tonight, put it in our heart, and let it minister us through the week, Lord God. Lord God, that we not just pay lip service to you, Lord God, but we invest in you, Lord God. I ask you because you are able and willing and good, Lord God, and you are everything that we need in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I asked you at the beginning if you knew where you've been, you knew where you are, knew where you're going. And here we have a situation where this poor fig tree was sitting there. And if you actually read in the the Mark's uh, version of this, it says it was out of season. This fig tree was out of season. It wasn't supposed to have fruit on it. So does that mean Jesus was having a hissy fit because there wasn't fruit when there wasn't supposed to be? No. He was proving a point. The point was, is that it doesn't matter what season it is, you are supposed to be fruitful. Just because it's not HYC doesn't mean the youth shouldn't be fruitful. Just because it isn't camp doesn't mean the children's church shouldn't be youth fruitful. Just because we're not having a special evangelist doesn't mean that the church shouldn't be fruitful. See, it doesn't matter what season it is in your life, you still are expected to be fruitful. Today's Christian, and I use quotes because they're not very Christian. If Christian means to be Christ-like, most people that profess Christianity are not Christ-like. But today's Christian do not want to talk about God's wrath. They want to talk about his grace. They want to talk about his mercy, his love. All those things that will let him, what does the Bible say? He winks at your transgressions. But there comes a time when he will no longer. They don't want to talk about that no longer. They want to talk about the part where he's winking at your transgressions. Oh, he loves you. He loves the way I am. He knows me. He knows that your heart is desperately wicked. Yes, he knows you. He knows that your tongue is an unruly member. He knows you. He knows that you are born in a habit of sin. He knows you. Like, I'm a good person. A good person does not get you into heaven. What does it say? The righteous are scarcely saken. Where will the sinner and ungodly be? That is the most scary scripture in the Bible. You can talk about any other scripture in the Bible. That is the scariest. Because that says, even though you think you're doing right, you may not be going. More so than help iron brimstone. That is the scariest scripture in the Bible. And here we see this poor fig tree who's supposed to be wearing fruit and represents the church, represents us as an individual. And this fig tree is not fruitful. It's out of season. It's, it's not good. It's not a good time for this tree. It's not having a good day. You know, it was, it was, it may have been a drought and it didn't have enough nutrients in the soil to, to bring fruit, but it had plenty of leaves. It looked healthy. But for some reason, something down inside of it was not healthy enough to bring fruit. Something in the situation in his life was not healthy enough to bring fruit. And here, Jesus walks by and he was no longer winking at the transgressions. He says, I curse you that you will wither and never for, never more bring fruit. Yep. Scary thought. Yep. Scary thought. What does he say? He will turn us over to a reprobate mind. Keep playing with God and you'll find yourself sitting out there in the world doing all the things you said you would never do and think you're okay. You'll justify it in your own mind. I can tell you how many men and women of God I've come across that used to be in the church and they will lecture me for hours justifying what they feel like they can get away with. I don't, I don't argue with people. I'm not a debater. You have people out that, you know, that will debate to no end. I just look at them and go, you know what you're supposed to do, and you know what you're not supposed to do. It ain't up to me because I don't judge you. I'm not going to be getting you into heaven. I can't drag you with me. I can't take you with me. I can't convince you. It'll be you and God on the day of judgment, not you, me, and God. Not you, your mom, and God. It'll be you and God. I'm not going to, I'm not going to debate it. This poor fig tree, we look at it and say, it's not fair. Our humanity says it's not fair. It's not fair that this fig tree was out of season and it didn't have fruit. It's not fair. Jesus had the power to look at that fig tree and say, give me a fig and it would grow one for it. But why didn't he? Because he was proving a point. He was letting us today know that we have no excuses, that what we need is around us. If you look in Luke 13, 6 through 9, story of another fig tree. It's a parable saying, He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, 
These three years I come seeking fruit from this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it in the ground? And he answered, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and, and fertilize it. And it will bear, and if it bear fruit, well. And if it not, then thou shalt cut it down. See, quote Christians outside of having a Holy Ghost experience in their life, having the power of God in it, don't have a vineyard dresser running around after them, trying to keep them from being cursed for lack of fruit. We have been blessed with vineyard dressers, men and women of God who constantly are beseeching God not to turn us over to a reprobate mind, constantly putting a hedge of protection around us, keeping us from falling into that mindset that we can justify our own faults and sins. We have men and women of God, mentors in our lives, moms and dads, cousins, brothers and sisters, people that are powerful in prayer, putting up a wall and a hedge around us to keep us safe. We fall into a rut, though, saying, well, God hasn't judged me for this sin that has been manifested in my life over and over again. It must be okay." No, it's not okay. Scary experience for me once I was working in an open heart recovery unit. I'm a nurse that don't those don't know. And I had a patient. He was sick. Oh, he was sick. And he had this look of fright over his face that uh, was was manifested when you walked in the room. You just knew it. And his daughter told me, she said, he's a Pentecostal preacher and he felt like when he was going under anesthesia, he saw the devil. And something clicked in my head and only the Holy Ghost kept me from saying what I wanted to say because both those women obviously were not living the lifestyle they were brought up in. And I walked over and prayed for him and I said, he wasn't coming to get you. He was coming to see if the hedge that you put around your family was going to go away. He wanted to see if he could get your girls. He wanted to see if he could get your son. He wanted to see if he could get your wife. But that prayer that you would put around them have protected them. They weren't real happy with me. I didn't go back the next day. (laughs) But sometimes it's got to be said. Sometimes people got to hear it. God, the devil wasn't coming for him. He wanted to see if his hands that he couldn't quite reach into that family because that hedge was around them was going to be able to start reaching in and getting those kids, those grandkids. There are people in this room that had brothers and sisters, moms and dads, pray that hedge around you. They may have been dead for years, but their prayer life was put as a pillar before God and is still there over your life. God is looking in his throne room and looking at you and seeing the devil coming to get you. He goes, no, 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 no. She prayed. She's got stuff stored up. I'm going to wait a little longer for them to come around to my way of thinking. I'm going to wait a little longer for them to come around to understand that they need to change their life. I'm going to let the men and women of God continue to work the soil around them so that they can become fruitful. There's a saying, if you are not moving forward, you're, not, you're moving backward. There is no stagnant. There is no weight. There is no holding. What does the Bible say? He, you, he'd rather you be hot or cold, but not lukewarm because he'll spew you out of his mouth. There are people sitting on the pew, have beautiful leaves on their fig tree, but never bear fruit. You're like, oh, oh, and he looks nice. He dressed, he, he's slim. He's got a nice tie. That's a nice tie, right? Nice suit. That, that suit's expensive. He must be holy. And he never bears fruit. Man, she, she, man, her hair's done just right, right? The skirt is the perfect length. I mean, the, 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 the shoes are perfect. I mean, they match that outfit perfectly. Oh, they have a beautiful voice. They raise their hands at the right time. Nope, they don't go all the way up. They don't go all the way down. There's that perfect 90 degree angle. Right? right? They got it down. Oh, they're feeling real spiritual. They turn their hands in. Yeah, they're spiritual. They must got it all, but they never bear fruit. They act the part. They look good. From a distance, you can see the beautiful leaves and the canopy. But when you get closer, there's nothing on the vine. There's nothing there. There's no substance. But yet, the man of God is still working. He's still toiling. I'm supposed to be encouraging you, and I don't want to discourage you because, guess what? The man of God is still toiling. He comes every Sunday, every Wednesday. He does his own Bible studies. He, he researches. He, he does the things that is necessary to get the word of God to you. It means there's still hope. That means God's like, okay, 
Okay. If you read in the Old Testament, if everybody wants to learn how to pray, I know I've had this question asked me a lot. You need, you need to look at Moses. Him and God had an interesting relationship. One moment, Moses is like, you need to just cast all these heathens out and kill them all because they're making fun of me. And then the next moment, God's like, I'm going to take Moses, get out of my way. I'm going to cast them all down because they're being rebellious. Moses is like, no, 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 no. Wait a little longer. No, no. What will the people say that you led them out into the wilderness and then just slain them? He promised Moses he would raise up a nation under his name. But Moses was like, no. The man of God is often standing between you and your judgment. The wages of sin are death. David, a man after God's own heart, cheats on his wife, kills the woman's husband. He asked God to forgive him. Guess what? He forgave him. But the wage was still there. That child was dead when it was born. The wage was still there. You have a man of God stepping in, trying to protect you. You smoked a pack of cigarettes for 30 years. God may well forgive you for the addiction. It does not mean you will not die of lung cancer. And I, you're like, oh, I believe God will heal you. Yes, I do. And he can. And if it's his, his will, he will. But let's face it. The wages of sin have a cost. You're like, well, I don't, I don't do anything like that. I, I come to church every, every time the service is open. And, and I'm here faithfully. And, and I always sing. And I, I, I join the choir. And I, 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 I teach Sunday school. And I do all those things. You're like, okay, do you have a prayer life at home? It ain't what I can see that you're going to be judged by. It's what I can't see. It's not what the man of God can see that you're going to be judged by. It's what the man of God can't see because Jesus sees all. God sees all. Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued ever hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sins, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily. Also those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, then for the people. For this he did once when he offered himself for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which it was since the law, maketh the son who is cons- consecrated forevermore. Not only is the man of God toiling in your life, but God himself is coming down and pricking your heart, telling you, hey, you need to change. It isn't just the, the mentor you have in your life that taught you Bible studies. It isn't just your youth pastor. It isn't just the, the person that is over your group. It isn't just the person that your neighbor that you sit next to that you've always looked up to. It isn't your old Sunday school teacher. They're not the only ones still praying for you and interceding for you. Jesus himself died on the cross that we have hope. We have no hope without his death, burial, and resurrection. Because what would be happening? We'd still be under the law. We'd still be cutting up lambs, and the sin wouldn't be forgiven. It'd be just pushed forward to another year. But because Jesus Christ... God himself, robed in flesh, came down and died on the cross. He continues to intercede on our behalf. By his stripes, we are healed. He continues to heal us. By his blood, he shed. Just like when when grandma prayed and there's a pillar in heaven. Jesus' actions don't just stop on the cross. They didn't just stop at the disciples. They didn't just stop when the New Testament ended. They continue to roll forward. That blood still cleanses. That blood still gives us hope. That blood still gives us passion. That blood still gives us grace. He's working in us. But we harden our hearts. And we feel like we're doing good enough. I'm doing good enough. I'm doing everything that's required. We're much like the rich young ruler that they talked, I think pastor talked about. We're doing good enough. But God's like, hey, I want you to do this. 
Now, I'm not going to judge you and tell you this is a heaven or hell issue that this God's, I'm, I'm talking to somebody in here. I'm not going to tell you this is a heaven or hell issue that God's putting on you right now, that he's pricking your heart, asking you to do something. But I will tell you, if you keep pushing him off, it will become a heaven or hell issue. Because disobedience is sin. God is winking at you like, okay, I understand. You've got excuses. What did he do for Gideon? He kept giving him signs. He kept giving him indications. He let him, he let him know that, hey, this really is my will. But eventually he would have been like, okay, Gideon, if you ain't going to do it, I got this guy over in the tribe of Levi. I'll ask him to do it. He's the lowest over there. Oh, I, I got this guy over in the, the, the tribe of, of I'm, he's the lowest over there. I'll go get him to do it. He gave, him, he gave him some time. He let him get his mind around what was going on. But eventually God was like, no, the deliverance needs to come. And if you ain't going to go, I will find someone else. And then you'll become bitter. Be like, God, you promised me. That preacher prophesied over me that I was going to do this. And, 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 and it didn't happen. And then God's like, yeah, I know. Because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And then you're holding God accountable. But he keeps working on you. Okay, I forgive you, baby. I, I, I understand. It was a bad time for you. You ask for forgiveness. It's under the blood. I got something new I want you to do. But you're comfortable where you are. Oh, oh, oh. Really? Uh, I can't do that. I've never done that before. God's like, good. If I wanted people that could do that before, I wouldn't have gone and gotten fishermen and tax collectors as my disciples. I would have gotten teachers and educators. I don't want somebody that's done it before. I want somebody that's completely new to it. That way, when some miracle happens, you can't say, look what I did. You can say, look what God did. He is giving us time and he's working in us. Oh, and how beautiful it is to see and to feel God working in your life. Yeah, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes he's got to cut some dead weight off. But oftentimes he's propping you up, making sure you don't fall over. A lot of times he's, he's digging and making sure your roots are deep and, and solid in, in his word. And you can feel the love as he works around you to make you bring forth fruit. He doesn't want you just to be a pretty tree. He wants you to be a fruitful tree. He doesn't want you just to appear Pentecostal. He wants you to be a Pentecostal. He doesn't want you to just to look apostolic. He wants you to be apostolic. He, he is not content with us just getting by. He is not content with us just doing what is necessary. He wants more. Acts 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come unto you, and ye shall be witnesses unto both Jerusalem and all of Judea and in Samaria and in unto the uttermost part of the earth. See, he didn't just say, Hey, I got these tasks for you. Now, I'm going to leave you with just the skills you have. I'm, you, just, you just go and do it. And you're like, I don't have the ability to do it. I don't have the, the, the vocabulary. I don't have the skill set. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the understanding. I don't have the connections. You can give an excuse after excuse after excuse. And if Jesus was just like, hey, go do it, then you, you'd be justified. But no, no, the Bible says he gave you power. Who here has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues? Who here has been baptized in Jesus' name? You've got power. You got power to do things that you're not qualified for. You got power to witness the people that are way above your educational understanding. You got power to reach that person that looks angry and mean and you would not approach them if your life depended on it. But you have power. God did not forsake you. He did not leave you. He did not leave you without anything. He gave you what you need. The Bible says that we would scarcely be forsaken. We wouldn't be seen for begging bread. Meaning, the little things like, you know, staying alive are not that big of a deal if we focus on him because God will take care of that little staying alive inconvenience thing. You know that hunger thing? God will take care of that and make sure that doesn't happen if you focus on him, if you do his will. He is empowering us to do more than we are now. He's empowering us to be better. He's empowering us to be more fruitful. He's empowering our worship to be more intense. He's empowering our praise to lift it up higher. He's empowering our words of our testimony to reach a little deeper. He's empowering us. He has given us the power to overcome. What does it say? To leap over a wall, run through a troop. 
That power didn't come from us. That power came from him. You're like, I can't do it. No, you can't. And that's what he's looking for. It's amazing to me. There'll be things that happen in my life and it's like, I need money and I, to get that done. Send somebody here, do something that, and I don't have a clue where that money's going to come from. My paycheck didn't change, but God wanted it done and it got done. And I look back and all the bills still got paid. I can only talk about me because if I talk about y'all, y'all get your feelings hurt. <laughs> I'm not building myself up because I have way, probably more problems than y'all do. So most of the time I preach to myself up here and y'all just get the benefit. But I want you to understand that it ain't about us. It's about him. Stop making it about you. And make it about him. Oh, you want to see some powerful move of God. Stop making it about how well you sound and stop, stop worrying about what the person is going to hear you say and start making it about what he hears. But like, it sounds silly, God. Don't mind. I promise you, when your little one or two year old got up here and sang Jesus loved me off key, you thought it was the greatest thing ever. When your niece or nephew were in that play, the man, and they were the wise men in the major scene and kept walking off the stage, you still loved every minute of it. God sees us that same way. It doesn't matter if it sounds good. It doesn't matter if it's on key. It doesn't matter if the words are pretty. His baby is praying to him. His baby is singing. And it moves him. It moves it. It's sweet incense that goes before his throne. See, when the Bible and, the, and Revelation says that our prayers are incense that goes before his throne, we all think it's got to be that, that, uh, that big prayer warrior up there that, you know, has all the right things to say. That's the only instance that, no, 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 no. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so by a three-year-old is just as powerful as the best prayer warrior that there ever been. I'll tell you right now, you need a healing. You need to stop hanging around here and start going to Sunday school. There's faith in there. You ask some of these five, six, seven-year-olds to come pray for you. There won't be a lack of faith. Oh, I can't do that. If God tells you, you better be crawling up into the Sunday school saying, how bad do you want that healing? Right? Like that, that one's wild. I can't let him pray for it. God doesn't, it's not about that. It's about what God's going to do through them. How many times, how many times you, you, you missed your blessing because you didn't want certain person to pray for you? God's like, go have that person pray for you. Like, oh, no. No, 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 no. Like, okay, well, blessings for someone else then. Humility. There are things that God empowers us to do. There are things that God allows us to do that reach beyond us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in, and I think we talked about, we've been talking about this for a while. We are past the transition season. We are now in a season of fruit bearing. If you have noticed we, we, we had shrunk during this whole COVID thing and, and was sporadic here and sporadic there. And people, had, you know, people that normally came every service were only coming now and then. All of a sudden now, those people are starting to become more consistent. But more importantly, new faces are coming in. We're going to start to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost just like we did before. We're going to see people baptized in Jesus' name greater than before because we have overcome a season of dryness. We have come overcome a season where God has grew us so that we can handle the outpouring that is coming. You know what happened when you had to be at home and working and watching a YouTube video? You had to learn self-discipline. You had to learn how to do certain things for yourself. God was using that as an opportunity for you to become a more mature saint so that he can empower you. Now you can teach a Bible study. I've never taught a Bible study. doesn't matter. I, I, I can't witness. Do you have a testimony? You can witness. Like, even your Sunday school kid has a testimony. Your five-year-old has a testimony. And they can get a 90-year-old person to come to church if they just share their testimony. Because it ain't about what comes out of your mouth. It's about what's in your heart and the power that God has given you. <laughs> we are blessed. We are blessed in this church. We have wonderful services. We have great moves of God. We have great preaching. We 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 get word from a diverse group of preachers coming in those that are even here the the guest speakers come in we have we have a great opportunity here but it's so easy to get comfortable it's so easy to get complacent it's so easy to to just bask in all that is around us and become a spectator and stop being a participant 
our season of COVID, our season of dryness is done. You're like, well, COVID's still there. Doesn't matter. For us, it's done. It's time to start growing. It's time to start working. It's time to start bearing fruit. God used that as an opportunity for us to grow. You had to watch that YouTube video on your own. You had to, you had to, you had to read the Bible on your own. You had to do certain things on your own because you couldn't get your normal group together to, to talk about it. You had to do it over the phone. You had to become a little bit more independent. Well, that independence is going to allow you to bring other people to church. Things that you never thought you could do before, God's going to say, it's time. There is no reason that on Wednesday night we don't have 40 to 60 kids in Sunday school. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm back there, so I can say that now so she doesn't get mad at me. But there's no reason why not. I've seen it done. I've seen a church go from 12 and 13 to 60 kids. It can happen. Why? Not because of anything that, that the Sunday school department did, but the congregation started inviting people to church. And guess what? When you invite adults, they bring their kids. And even though the adults may be, uh, I don't know, their kids have a good time in Sunday school. Guess what? They'll keep coming back because their kids are having a good time in Sunday school. And there's a light in them. There's no reason our youth group isn't busting at the seams. There's no reason why this congregation isn't overflowing once again on the pews. There's no reason why our parking lot isn't overflowing. You're like, well, COVID, people are scared. People are scared, but guess what? If they're scared, they're looking for that power that is within you. They want it for themselves. They want that experience with Jesus for themselves. They want that walk with God for themselves. They have this hole in their life and they try to fill it with alcohol and they try to fill it with drugs and they try to fill it with cigarettes. But it's always there, always empty, always gnawing at them. They can never fill it up. Oh, but when they come into the house of God and they feel the presence of God strong and mighty in this place and they watch people they don't even know lift up their hands and worship Jesus. They see them come down to the front. Tears coming down their eyes and give everything to God. God. Oh, it moves them. They don't understand it. They don't comprehend it, but it doesn't matter. God is plucking at their heart. Just come on down. Come on down. We have it here. Stop bottling it up. Stop holding that power in and just being a spectator. Let that power go, not only here, but every moment of your life, every day at work, every day at the gym, every day, wherever you go throughout the day, the store, let the power of God manifest in you. Don't put yourself in a box because you're holding God back. Allow God to move. I have witnessed somebody and made a complete fool of myself. Had said all the wrong things. I walked back. I was walking out of it and I knew. I was like, oh, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I taught Bible studies on this. How did I mess it up so much? They came to church anyway. Not because I did anything great, but I witnessed to them and then they found a card sitting on a gas pump that belonged to the same church they just got witness to the other week before and they realized it was a moment in God because God was calling them you're like well well you, you did a terrible job it didn't matter it wasn't about me God had a purpose maybe me stumbling over and making a fool of myself was just what that person needed to come to God if that's what it's case I'll do it a million times if I can get one and I have to witness to a million, it was worth a life. A lifetime of work, if I only get to save one. But Stephen, the martyr, was not, he'd done great things, but there was only one convert associated to him, the Apostle Paul. You say, what a waste of a life. He was moved by God. He was a young man. He was doing miracles. He was doing signs and wonders. And they stoned him to death. What a waste of a life. But from his tragedy... Three-fourths of the New Testament was written. We have power that God has given us. It's just time to use it. Stand with me. I invite you to the front. I don't know what's going on in your life. I, I don't know if you, you have a situation you need to deal with. If you come down and ask one of the men of God to pray for you, we will, and we will address that situation. But if things are going good, I want you to come up here, lift your hands and offer praise and worship to him like you haven't done in a long time. I want you to worship and praise him just like it was the first time you received the Holy Ghost with everything you have. We get a little sophisticated sometimes when we've got the Holy Ghost for a while. We, we can't do the things we used to do. There ain't nothing wrong with being hungry for God. There ain't nothing wrong with desiring God in a, in a mighty way. 
There's nothing wrong with grabbing a hold of him and saying, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to let go until I get that anointing. I'm not going to let go until I get that miracle. I'm not going to let go until that hedge is strong around my family. I'm not going to let go until that barrier is over my children. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. I'll worship you until I can worship you no longer. I'll praise you until my voice gives out. I'll raise my hands until I can hold up no longer. I won't sell short on you, God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. If you need prayer, I invite you to come right here in front of the podium and we'll pray for you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. A couple of ladies, a couple of ladies of faith, I need you up here. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, I got one right here. I need some more ladies right here. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You ain't got to wait for me to get down there. The miracle will be happening before I get there. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're so inclined, put your hand on her head. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, if you see somebody praying and God pricks your heart. Like, I don't know who they are. I don't know what's going on in their life. It doesn't matter. Go. But they're all the way on the other side of the church. It doesn't matter. Go. They already got the preacher praying for them. Stand there and wait till they're done. And then go in. Allow the power inside of you to manifest itself here in a safe environment. So that you'll be anointed and feel like confidence when you're out in the world.